Good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Good to see you again. Let's see who's lurking this evening. I see Celeste 29 is in. Hey, Darius. Hey, Celeste. Uh, I promise him Finisil, uh, Skinny Seahorse, and Suska Jose. Good to have you here. So, Zizvik, uh, we're going to carry on with something we started playing with at the end of last week, which was we noticed that there were some... Um, some allocations happening per frame um, in this little example we we're working on. And it seemed like too many. Um, so we started looking into that. I did a little um, bit of research into it after the stream. And I'm going to kind of go through my steps. Also, I'm hoping Metagan's going to be here tonight because um, they did some uh, profiling as well. And, were, um, and got some nice uh, kind of nice readouts here. And apparently they were using... Swank monitor in slime. So I don't know about that. I'd love to hear more about this. I know that slime has slime profile, which I've never used, but I'm guessing it's connected to that. So hopefully, um, Medigan's normally along a little later. So um, if they stop by, that'd be cool. Otherwise, we'll try and work some of this stuff out ourselves. So first off, is the I guess the audio video is coming through okay, folks? We don't have Pomdom here at the moment, so it's hard to tell. Okay, so we stop um, our project for now. Um, the way this little um, def simple main loop thing, which comes from Nineveh, is set up, is that you can call um, you call this. This specifies the name of the function it's going to define. Um, you call it with start or stop as a keyword, and optionally a number of frames that you want to run. So that's just how many frames it's going to run the loop for. Um, it also has this thing that's going to get called on start. I'm going to remove that for now. Because we, we've we already um, initialized everything and loaded in all the assets we want. Um, so we want to be able to just do start one and run one frame. Um, and <laughs> AV is okay. Thank you. Um, yes. And, and so with that, we're going to be able to run a specified number of frames. And then we're going to profile it. The reason we don't want to do the um, startup stuff is that that's going to do a bunch of allocations in itself. We're not really interested in those. We're just interested in the frame-to-frame -frame costs. So one of the things I forgot about from last week, if I just go and find the SBCL manual, is that there actually is an allocation profile. If I just go alloc dynamic extent allocation following dynamic allocation profiling statistical profiler here we go so the statistical profiler which we did start playing with um has ways of doing this it actually has a nice helper macro that i either forgotten about or didn't know about uh, called with profiling so basically we're going to take this guy and we're going to paste it here we're going to notice that there is a mode setting here called Alex. So this is going to be um, profiling the allocations as far as I know. And the statistical profiler works by just, um, as far as I remember, taking samples of the program um, execution at regular intervals. So it wakes up every now and again and sees where it is. Um, so it doesn't instrument all the functions. Um, so it's, it's lighter weight, so things tend to run a bit faster. And um, yeah, it, it, it's just a different tool in the box. Um, any profiler is going to give you some kind of bias or some kind of overhead. So having different profilers we can use gives us a better picture. Um, I'm going to show this one first, and we're going to see what kind of data we get out of it. And then, um, yeah. So let's set this going with 1,000 frames and just see what we get back. So this guy's going to miss the start. No worries, man. Good to see you. Okay, so that ran nice and fast. Um, I think before the stream, because I was messing around, um, I disabled VSync. So things are going to be going a little quicker than normal. Uh, so we went through, I don't know how many frames there, 1,000 frames very quickly. Um, but we collected a bunch of samples. And here are the results. So we need some to look up how to interpret uh, these results. Because there's three sections, self, total, and... Um, Cumul, which I think is uh, cumulative. So let's go and have a look at what this means. Okay, the flat report format, which I believe is what we're using. Let's uh, go up here, report flat. 
um, will show a table of all the functions that the profiler encountered on the call stack during sampling, ordered by the number of samples taken while executing that function. Right, interesting. Okay, now I'm not sure when it comes to allocations. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm just gonna invert this because my eyes just can't handle that. Um, let's make it a little bit bigger and find out where we were because now I've just thrown our offset off. Um, okay, here we are. Um, for each function, the table will show three absolute and three relative sample counts. The self um, column shows samples taken while directly executing that function. Um, the total column shows samples taken while executing that function or functions called from it, uh, sampled to a platform specific depth. Now there is a little caveat down here, which says allocation profiling is only supported in SVCL builds that use generational garbage collector, which we are using the generational garbage collector. Tracking of call stacks at a depth of more than two levels is only supported on x86 and x86.64. So basically we're in a good place for getting uh, good results here. So the, oh yeah, so the total column actually sounds very interesting to us because it's, we really want to know just kind of, we want to know downstream of us where these allocations are coming. Um, the uh, cumulative column shows the sum of all self columns up to and including that line in the table. Don't know why that's useful, but sure, it doesn't hurt us for to have it there. Um, Darius is saying, by the way, sure this saw this during the week. Um, ooh, we made a Dungeons and Dragons inspired role playing game. That's cool. And as Darius mentioned there, um, I am working on something similar during my uh, during my day job. So be cool to see what this is. Ooh, that's pretty groovy, actually. Look at that. That's neat. It's always nice to see more things and more tools in this space. I just love storytelling. So it's kind of like any tools for doing that. This seems like, yeah, more of a strategy game. Obviously they're saying inspired role-playing game. So, oh man, thanks. I'm gonna have to look into that. Let's pop that up there. And we'll come back down to this. Oh no, we were looking at the manual, weren't we? Right, oh, and it's all the wrong way around, okay. How do you do this contrast inversion? I am using a, a, a kind of standalone compositor called something. What is it called? Um, it is called... Where are you? Can't see it. What's the uh, control I maybe? Invert window. So what does invert window do? Compton. That's the thing we're looking for. Um, so yeah, I invoke uh, Compton uh, from, and it just has an option where you can specify the GL backend and invert colors um, include apparently. Wow, that's neat. What am I passing in? IDs pattern. I have no idea what that is about. Oh, I guess that's the IDs of the windows that you want inverted. Cool. <laughs> I can't remember writing this function, but I clearly did. Uh, yeah, Compton's cool. Definitely look into that. Um, I still haven't moved over from using Stump to using um, Emacs as a window manager, because one of the things that we absolutely need for this stream is to be able to lock this to this view and um, behind here. I don't want anything, because obviously you guys can't see it. So I just put the... Um, the Slack um, IRC stuff behind my face in this region. Sorry, I'm, I'm moving. For once, I'm actually indicating with a cursor and you can't see it because it's behind my face. In this area, behind here is another version of the Twitch chat, so I, I miss it less. Uh, thanks for the recommendation for doing that, by the way. Um, so yes, I've never found a way that you can, that can force Emacs categorically to never resize or shift shit around. And without that, I really can't switch because it would just break these streams and it'd be so frustrating. It's fine for my laptop and everything, but yeah, not for not for this. Um, yeah, so where are we? And yeah, some of the times I'm really interested in keeping the aspect a certain way or the resolution at a certain point. Um, Median, hello! 
you're exactly who we needed to see. Um, yes, and we'll get to you in a minute. Stand by. You are, you are up soon. Um, right, so we were just understanding how this works. And the profile also hooks into the disassembler such that instructions which have been sampled are annotated with their relative frequency of sampling. This information is not stored across different sampling runs, which makes sense, which is super cool. So what it would mean is if you're doing normal um, profiling, let's bring up, is there a function in here? Um, yeah, let's, let's just actually say the dissolve pipeline. If we go disassemble, um, what is it? Line this uh, symbol, never which way around symbol. Um, did that not work? Yes, there we go. Um, you can bring up the disassembly, and it will annotate this with the frequency information of the samples. Which, is, if you're trying to optimize a function, can be really handy. So yeah, highly recommended. Super cool. Um, Again, I need to learn assembly more before that's super useful to me, but it is really nice to have it in the toolbox. Okay, so we have some results here from our allocation profile. And we can see up the tops there are certain things we'd actually expect to see. So some of the stuff that we're getting every frame, because um, we sampled for a thousand frames and it woke up. Like the numbers we're getting here aren't going to be the numbers of times these functions are called. Because remember, the profile is going to wake up just every now and again. Uh, it's gonna, sorry, it's going to be sampling our program every now and again. So it's getting like a snapshot. But things that are happening more frequently are more likely to be sampled, are more likely to be happening when the sampler, you know, takes the sample. So we can see the um, matrix construction. This is going to be one of the main things um, that is allocating um, our memory, which makes a lot of sense. So we can find out where that's coming from. So there's... Um, making a translation matrix, just making some regular matrix. Um, there's a perspective matrix being made. All this stuff we're doing every single frame. So that at least accounts for some of our allocations. Um, the RTG math functions, so make obviously is always going to allocate. But um, translation doesn't necessarily have to. There is, um, RTG math has, generally has two um, packages per concept. So say like there's vector2 and there's vector2 non-consing. Um, so if we look in here, we can see this is RTG math matrix four. And where's translation? Uh, translation. And if I jump here, the hyphen N is the non-consing. Uh, if we jump over there, we can say see that this thing takes a matrix to mutate and then the uh, vector that it's creating the uh, translation matrix from, and it writes the results into the matrix that you gave it. Um, so this way you're avoiding allocations. Um, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it um, it definitely works. And uh, yeah, it's a nice way. When you have a block of code where you know you don't need to be allocating a ton of times, just being able to pass a matrix through and modify it is pretty handy. And so yeah, here we can see RTG math matrix for non-consing, which means not allocating in lispy parlance. So we could swap those out. Um, there's a few things we don't know about here. There's this Lambda that's apparently doing a bunch of allocations. I don't know what that is. It's happening in render. Um, and the fact that it's not got a name that I recognize at all suggests that, well, this is clearly internal uh, to SBCL because we see the SB hyphen. PCL um, is, this is, C, the, the PCL here is talking about common loops, which is an older object system than um, CLOS. And there is some kind of implementation that in compiler. I'm not entirely sure what it's used for. It might be bootstrapping. Um, but yeah, I, there is something going on there. Um, we can see that there is um, a bunch of calls to CFFI type parser. Not that many considering the number of times we're called, but I also find that rather disturbing. Like CFFI, like, What's cool about uh, uh, the FFI and Lisp is that um, you can just hand it like uh, you can just hand it data, and it will if it it will if you haven't told it the type in certain cases, it will go and look things up. Um, I, but we really try and avoid that in, inside Keppel. We we always declare types everywhere and try and make sure that it's going to get optimized. So I'm not sure exactly what that is. 
There's viewport resolution, which again, if we look at this function, uh, we're, alloc we're creating a new vector two here. So every time this is called, this is allocating a new vector two. Um, so that really tells me that we need uh, non-consing versions of Keppel functions too. So anything that's meant to be returning data, maybe you could pass something in and it will write the data into that. Actually, that's probably something we should file an issue for. So feature requests. Um, do we have a feature request thing? Enhancement, I guess. Um, add non-consing versions of funks in Keppel. That, um, Allocate, I guess. E.g. Um, viewport resolution. Um, yeah, that'll do for now. Sign me, submit. Cool. So that makes sense. These are all places we would expect. Q um, exclamation mark here is create quaternion. So again, more allocations happening. We can see swank handle requests. Um, which is um, the function that we're calling to um, keep the REPL alive while this thing is running. Um, that allows us to, yeah, use the REPL while things are running. It's part of our live coding setup. And again, we don't mind that doing some allocations because it's so useful, it's worth it. Um, make string output stream. This hasn't happened much. It might be part of this, I don't really know. Um, again, we've got a vector negate here. Um, which is the consing version of negate, so it's creating a new vector. We could swap that out if we if we knew we could um, that nothing else was holding to that vector. We could just negate that ourselves. Um, lists uh, Keppel viewports update default frame buffer dimensions. That's kind of annoying that that's allocating a bunch of stuff. How many times is that happening? Not too many. Um, I have to look into where that's called from. Let's just jump to its definition and see. Okay, so in set resolution, so something's calling set resolution on the default frame buffer. I bet that's happening. Um, maybe we're being lazy about that in our project and just um, setting that ourselves. So that might be that might be the fault of, of us in the play with verts project that where we've been doing all this stuff and not Capel's fault. We'll see. Um, there's some asymp stuff. Um, there's some key th some threading stuff going on. What? Um, yeah, so then we're getting down to the minutia here. I mean, we can see that, like, um, oh, that's interesting. Oh, okay, right. So I'm guessing that some of these eval things is probably stuff we've been doing from... I don't know, I guess from the REPL? Um, and it makes sense, there's this swank call with a restart and all this kind of stuff, so... Um, yeah, th this is this is just gonna be related to something we've typed in the REPL um, that's getting evaluated, probably creating the, the thing that allocate, that did all this report, sorry. So that is probably related to the string stuff too, I'm just guessing, so I'm not, basically, I'm not worried about that. Um, But there is something that that I see right here that is rather disturbing. And it lines up with what I found after the stream last time. Um, and it's this. Vario. Type spec to type. This function um, is you is part of um, is part of Vario, part of our Lisp to GLSL compiler. Um, and it will take a type specification like, let's just go use this, I can just show you, um, vec3, and it will return um, the object that represents that type. So that's used a lot inside the compiler. Um, we also use this a bit inside, um, inside Keppel when we're converting between those objects and type specs for certain reasons. But all of these things should only be happening um, when you've asked for something to compile. Like we shouldn't be compiling things unless the user's requested something to compile. Um, we shouldn't be allocating things unless the user's already made some kind of, made an allocation. So Keppel does allocate more than it, you just would with GL. Like if you create a new GPU buffer, we create that object, obviously, we the wrapper around that uh, GL object, but we also 
add it to what some of our internal caching information, our GL cache stuff, that obviously has some overhead, but we should only be um, extending or allocating anything like that while you, whilst you are already allocating something else. So basically your costs go up slightly, but we try not to do anything else. So your frame to frame cost should be zero, like, uh, sorry, allocation should be zero. Um, obviously there's a lot of overhead just from being in Lisp and in a kind of dynamic language, so. But we try and keep it low as possible while still being friendly as possible. Um, so yes, that I believe is an issue. In fact, what we're gonna do in a second is um, if I go to issues, I stuck a, a thing in here explaining the problem to myself. So we'll come back to that. But Metiam, it is a good job you're not driving this time. Um, you showed here these uh, reports, just like the profiling things we did before. Um, but you mentioned you were using Swank Monitor in Slime. Um, how are you using that? I've seen Slime um, Slime Profile, but not sure about the Swank Monitor stuff. So if you could tell me anything about that, that'd be really cool. And um, Arusius says, Common Loops is my favorite programming language. I'm not sure if you are being sarcastic or if you're really into that, because I'm sure there must be some people who are into it still. Or Asus or... Rusius, that seems more like. Again, like I say, every week I'm changing the name. Um, tell me more about it. Okay. It was meant to be a joke. Problem is, man, like, all of you are clearly broken people. You're tuning in to see a confused hairy man type lisp every week. And you come back every week. So I, I have to imagine that what you people do for fun is as broken as mine. So, so you might be really into common loops. That could be a thing. Um, Median says, used Swank Monitor in Slime with both CCL and SBTL. Swank Monitor. Okay. I don't know what that is. If I type Swank, no, there's nothing in Emacs for Swank. But obviously Swank is a um, is is the, the common lisp part of the equation. The Swank Mop, but not Swank Monitor. I saw slime profile and here is like how to profile entire package or profile list profiled functions, get the report, reset. Um, oh, it's not active for SBCL normally, huh? So do I do a require? Um, what's it called? Uh, swank monitor. monitor. Nope. That's just telling us some nicknames went away. Um, it's not active for SBCL normally. I've added SBCL. Do you, do you let us know? Um, oh, it, it takes some tweaking. I can put up a branch and get out. Oh, right. Okay. That's cool. Um, that might be a little out of our... What, what does it add over just using um, SB profile and... Um, Prof, and uh, sorry, and the statistical profiler from SBCL. Oh wait, is that a completely separate thing? No, that was actually. That's pretty cool though. I'm interested if it, if it can do allocations because that would be very relevant to our stuff right now. Be cool to test it though. What I will do, seeing as that's a bigger um, step. It hooks all the functions so it's not sampling. Ah, cool, okay. Um, yeah, that makes sense. What I will do then, I'll just dive into what I did to get this information. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll see where we are because we've got, we've got plenty of time basically this week. I haven't got much of a plan other than we were gonna do some profiling. Um, but I'd like to show how I got to find this thing because I know last, 
people were talking about the profiling stuff being interesting. So let's try and follow this. So the I was getting annoyed. Uh, I was looking at time and I was running this and I was seeing there was a bunch of bytes const. And it was pretty reliable um, how many in general, um, kind of the 400, 500 K range um, every time, which is rather disturbing. And when um, I made 10 frames, it went up by roughly 10. So it suggests that it, these are per frame costs. We know that we're not doing the uh, reset every time we run start now. Let's just double check that, I suppose, by going into reset and saying print resets. All right, no reset printed here. So that's not what we're doing. Um, but we are clearly allocating a bunch of data. And the problem with that, from, from my point of view, I, I don't want Keppel to do anything, do any allocations at times when you're not really allocating. You haven't already made that decision that you want that cost. Um, I believe that like, if you're making tools for people um, that are meant to be vaguely in the kind of performant range, you shouldn't be making those kind of decisions for people. Um, yeah, I, I don't like it. So we need to find out what that is. So the first thing I was doing was going down into uh, game step and I kind of just want to re remove possibilities. So here's where we draw a bunch of stuff. And then this is where we're doing the um, bloom and things like this. And most of this is, um, even though we are doing map G and things in here, most of this is straight GPU work. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to comment this out and see what happens. Okay, so we've still got a whole bunch of allocations that those didn't go away. So that clearly isn't the big, the big loss here. Um, let's get rid of as frame. So now we're going to, we're no longer updating over here. If we cleared this, it would I can do that now. Yeah, we've got nothing now. Still a whole shit ton of allocations. So let's make sure it's not uh, the event system because I know that this uh, decay events is, is a function in Skitter, which is my input library. And I know that thing does allocations at times I don't want it to. So that is, again, that's been on my to-do list for a very long time. Still high. So um, we've got stuff to do with time. That's been very unlikely to be the problem. Updating the camera. Get rid of that. Not that. Hey, look, we're setting the current viewport's resolution. Um, the current viewport, I would bet a small amount of money, is um, going to be the viewport of the default frame buffer. Um, so when we set this, we're going to be setting the size of the default frame buffer, which account for some of the allocations we were seeing. Um, that again, that really shouldn't be allocating too much, but I, but we do have some allocation going on here where we're grabbing that resolution. So anyway, let's take that out, and we would expect to see, whoops, a little bit less. There's not much less, but it is a little bit less. Um, but that's only happening one time. Really, it's going to be in here. And here we've got, we're drawing things that. Um, are not of type ball and then we're drawing things which are type ball daft but if we remove clearly if we remove this now um, then we're down to zero bytes const for our 10 frames all right so we know it's in here somewhere and it's not going to be to do with clearing the fbo and it's very unlikely to be do to do with uh with fbo bound um so let's do this Let's um, keep the stuff that's about um, about the ball. Let's get rid of this because it's going to be much less. Okay, so we've still got most of it. Let's remove update. Update is going to have some allocations because if we go into here, um, this is what calculates new positions for things. And let's have a look. Updating the camera and stuff like this. We're not doing that. We're doing update thing. Um, actually, it doesn't do very much at all. So let's remove that. I guess we're moving everything with shaders right now. So again, it's all in here. Um, and how many things have we got in general? So we are 
looking at about 300, about 400 things. Um, whoops. So we're doing a small amount of allocation for each of those. And so we're going to keep going. Let's go into draw. Let's see what's going on in there. Um, let's just do this guy. And let's remove that and see what happens. Okay, that has not dropped significantly, actually. That's very strange. Let's look at the others. Oh, yes, because the majority of our objects are asymp things. These are things that were loaded by the asymp um, importer. So now if we do it, now we're down to zero bytes const. Occasionally 32k, um, which might be... Okay, my, my theory for this, and I'm not sure how good it is, um, is that that might be when um, SPC... Uh, the garbage collector itself is allocating a new page or requesting a new page. I'm not really sure what's going on there, but there is some small chunks. But let's say that this is the problem, right? And this is what I was worried about because we've got a map G, which is a, we're going to map over a GPU function with this stream. This should not be allocating in the general case. Now, um, let's remove all the uniform uploads and do it again. And we see that now we're doing the call, but we're back to our case where we're normally zero bytes. So it's something in the uniforms. Um, why not draw it, reduce it to a single draw call to see how much? Because to be honest, um, I just wanted, I kind of wanted to narrow it down um, just to where it's roughly coming from. Um, and I'm not sure how, like if it's very small amounts, I'm worried it might be hidden um, within other allocations. So this is like something significant. We can't miss it when it's 10 frames and it, when it's with a lot of things. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of my vague logic. I must admit, it's not, it's not based on too much. But let's just uncomment these, time it. Okay, so we're seeing some things there. So something in there is accounting for a lot of what the problem is. We're back to zero again, okay? Let's look at everything except those. Okay, that's accounting for a bunch as well. Now, some of the things we've already seen, projection um, is going to be calculating a projection matrix for that camera. We've got world to view space and get a uh, model to world space. Both of those functions do um, matrix four transforms that we already saw in our um, allocation profile earlier. So those are acceptable, right? That's not um, that's not Keppel that's causing that problem. That's the choices of us um, using Keppel. So we go back to this and we're down to our zero bytes again, or occasionally 32K. Quite, re quite often 32K. That's still a bit um, interesting to me. It still feels like there are a lot of small allocations going on that aren't really being registered, and then we just get a chunk. So I'd love to know what that is. I'd love more precision in this, but... You know, it's it's nice that we've got tools to do it, to be honest. Not every dynamic language has them. So, I'm going to jump forward. Um, checking again. Zero bytes. So now the only thing left is this. So here are a whole bunch of allocations happening. Um, and... It's something about lights. What is it about lights that is causing this to be an issue? Um, well, it's a UBO. So one has to wonder, what's it doing with that UBO? Um, so let's go and jump to asset pipeline and macro expand and look for whatever that thing was. Let's look at things again. Uh, Cisco has it. You're right. It could be a. It, it could make it a problem. The reason I'm doing it this way, really, is as well, is that, like I mentioned, I had a look at this at the end of the last stream, and this is these are the steps I took to get to where it was. So I'm just kind of chasing it down. Like when I know where a problem lives, I, I can start actually dealing with what the problem is and whereabouts exactly. And um, but now we know we're looking for UBOs in some fashion. We know it's called lights. So let's look amongst this big soup of stuff down into, hey, ASIM pipeline. See, I ignored that in the um, in the profile because I thought it was to do with ASIM itself, but of course it's not. It's it's this pipeline function. Oh, fuck me, I could have, uh, we could have just seen it in the Alec profile. Again, I, last week I'd forgotten or didn't know about the um, statistical profile as Alec mode. Let's go look at that again quickly. 
um, what was it called? With oh, uh, oh yeah, SB. There we go. Where is it? Do, 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 do. Um, Asset pipeline here. Whole bunch of stuff happening here. All right. And actually, we can see, yeah, where are we? Uh, yeah, down here. There's this this function that we get down into asset pipeline. So this is where we are right now in this. Um, so we're down into the function that actually does the stuff, and we're going to keep on looking for lights and see where that upload is handled. Here we go. So when some value is passed in for the uniform lights, uh, we map it to this val, the value called val. Sorry, this variable called val. For reasons, it doesn't really matter. Um, when um, there is a known uniform ID for this, and this is greater than zero, again, other setup time things. Um, and here is a big ugly problem. Here it's checking to see, uh, it's checking for the type of the UBO argument, right? But it's doing it in a stupidest way. And it's super embarrassing to me that this is the problem. Um, but it is what it is, so we have to look at it. This is the, um, this is the GL call that's binding this uniform. Um, that's fine. This is the error that, um, if this fails. So what is this check? It's calling some vario, like it's checking the equality of two types. It's converting a type spec to a vario type. So it's allocating an object that represents this type. And then it's comparing that to the data type that's in, um, in the object wrapping the uniform. So let's just go back here again and look at lights. Um, this is a UBO object. And we can see that, hmm. Can't see exactly what I'm looking for there. Let's bring up the macro expansion again. Do do do. EBO data type. How does that work? Okay, it looks at the GPU array. And in here. No, wait a second. Element type. Okay, element type is light set, okay. So wait, what is it? This might be stupider than I even thought it was. So the thing that's coming out of here is gonna be a symbol, this symbol, right? And then it's doing a type of quality against this, but it's, it's taking this symbol and it's turning it into a type object. That's bonkers, wait a second, does that work? I mean, I, I can understand why that might be in the compiler. So let's have a look. Let's put lights here. True. Right. Okay. So let's look at the values. I thought this was going to be embarrassing, but it seems to be more embarrassing than I thought. Yeah. Okay. So we're taking a symbol and we're comp then we're taking the same fucking symbol, which we could have just compared. And we're making it into a vario type object first. Why? Why? That's so dumb. Ugh, okay, fine. Anyway, that's not what we want to do. What we should be able to do, is we'll go find the code that's doing this. Let's look at, take v type eq, um, and then we'll go into the works capital core, pipelines probably, and we'll grep this and here it is and it's in there twice because I guess we've got the UBO assigner and we've got the SSBO assigner down here so really we just want to remove this the only th reason I can think that we might want to do that is we might want to um, convert it to a Right, there are um, alternate names for types. So, hmm. 
yeah I'm just trying to think of a good reason why we might want to let Vario resolve it back down. Basically, if we take the name and then convert it to the compiler type object and then convert it back into a spec again, and we can do this at compile time, so we don't have to do this on every call, um, then we would make sure that we get the specification that makes the most sense. But UBOs can only be structs anyway, and the struct names don't have aliases, so I think... No, I think that's bullshit. I think this is it. I think this is the only thing we needed to do. Um, okay, so with that done, um, we can say G here. That's just going to regenerate it, well, that re-expand that macro. We go looking for lights again. We look for the upload. And here we go. Now it's going to look up the data type from the UBO, and it's going to compare it to the symbol light set. So that looks a lot more sensible. Let's go into render and recompile. No errors I can speak to speak of, just a couple of things that are saying they've been redefined, which is fair. And let's go and time some stuff again. Whoa. Oh wait, V time oh, fucking idiot, Chris. Okay, so Oh no, I've forgotten where it is now. V type equal. Yes, we're comparing symbols now. We don't need v-type equal. We need equal. I'm guessing what happened was I was... I did that while compiling. I just dumped some things in and... Sorry, did this while developing the feature and then never came back and cleaned it up. I should have left myself a note. Um, I should have left myself an issue. Don't know why I, I closed that buffer again, but never mind. Let's go back to render. Let's recompile this. Let's go back to the REPL and then we can say time. And now, now we're down to our 32K and zero. Okay. So I don't like how frequently that 32K is coming up. I don't know what that is. Um, but we don't have great tools for digging into that yet. So I suppose we can, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what that's gonna be. Pomdefim's here. AV, okay, we can start now. Thanks, man. Perfect timing. Um, right, let's. Uh, let, I, I'm a little behind because I was rambling there. Um, so, Medigan's been doing some good stuff. It's all the functions, it's not sampling. Um, yep, we did that bit. And yeah, so actually, yeah, it was actually vaguely up to date. Medigan's saying, here's what I'm getting now. I'm going to. I trust you, so I will click your link on the stream. Let's, let's do this. And let's see. Okay, so. Um, this is really cool that you've got consing information, though. That is really good, man. Is that what your uh, thing? Yeah, your thing saw that right away. Dude, that's kick ass. I really need to use this profiler because that is good information. Do you know how it's doing that? If you push the Vario change, I'll check with Swank Monitor. Uh, it's, it's in Keppel actually, so I'll go do that. Uh, but for sure, yeah, let's do that now. Thanks, man. This is great. Um, we don't need that. We do need this. Um, and this is... Um, remove some use of... Um, ah, no, right. Um, I'm sh I really shouldn't push this to master. Let's do this. Let's do a fix branch and it's um, pipeline um, V type. That's what we're going to call it. I'm just going to drop that into chat so Medic and can use it. That's going to be the branch which we're going to push to. Um, we're going to start from master. That's the new branch. Um, we're going to bring this in. Fix don't use of uh, v type equal inside um, pipeline code. Let's push this up to origin. And it's pushed. 
yeah, if you if you could test that, that'd be super cool, man. Um, and in the meantime, I will quickly look at what this swank monitor thing is. Okay, so all right, so it's part of slime, but you've been fixing up to work with um, SBCL, which is really cool. Um, we could also test in CCL. Like um, Keppel should work there. Well, does work there just fine. One thing I think I'll do though, while you're doing this, I'm just going to restart the session. Um, I'm gonna go and run some tests. So let's just do the Vario test first. They're not gonna have been affected, but it's habit for me to go and run all the tests every now and again. So this is good. 5 a.m. run all tests. I do need to do an episode on 5 a.m. at some point. I'll do that for the little bits of Lisp stuff. Um, then uh, quick load the Keppel tests. And this is pr is going to be more useful. It'll run all of those and then all of the specific Keppel tests. And the, when it reruns the Vario ones, it actually compiles the GLSL, so it's much more useful. Um, okay, good. We got through those. And now I'm just going to go to Keppel examples. Uh, and of course, we don't have that. So QL, quick load, um, asim, fallback libs. Right, then we'll quick load a couple examples again. Mondo Pimp saying, sorry to jump in. What is the topic we're covering right now behind side hacking content? We were looking into um, why there were unnecessary allocations going on per frame um, in, um, well, we were seeing if it was inside Keppel because it looked like they were coming from Keppel. And there were some that were coming from Keppel and a bunch of them were just us um, allocating new objects in um, when we were rendering stuff inside our play with verts project so we chased um we chased that down oh i just saw a really interesting um question from js joel and i have an answer for you sir which i'm yes um yes yeah, so we've chased we've chased something down uh we're testing that now um we've been looking a little at just some profiling stuff yeah it's been cool we're getting there uh, we found a really ugly mistake inside keppel and we fixed it uh we think um, we've just run the, some tests and they were good, uh, but I need to know that basically I've, I've got more tests I just throw at things, so I'm going to run those now while um, Metian is testing out the change. So if I go to Keppel examples and go into the pre-release run file um, and compile that and then go into package Keppel examples and say run them all, um, what it'll do is start running a bunch of tests. This is an old implementation of Bloom I did. Um, it's a game of life thing. And basically it just runs them all one by one. Um, and I just kind of keep an eye out for things crashing. Um, it's normally done at a slightly bigger resolution. So yeah. Some of them look exactly the same, but are exercising different things. That last one looks the same as this one, but it's using Lambda pipelines instead of regular, like uh, top level pipelines, a little Ray Marcher, uh, showing first class functions. We've got, yeah, some texture um, sampling stuff. This is a shared context. So um, things being re like rendered and uploaded from different contexts. Basic texturing. This is using transform feedback and using queries to query the number of uh, things drawn. That's where those little number twos were. Triangle, it's just a triangle. Big triangle that's using a UBO to set the scale of the triangle. Um, basic 3D objects, so basic 3D objects. Um, some geometry shader stuff and some blending stuff basically it just goes through and exercises a few things and if it doesn't basically if all the things don't crash that was a skybox this is some instancing things um if all of them don't crash this is absolutely fucking terrible normal mapping it's not normal mapping it's just splatted on the shaders anyway yep here's i can't really show it here but that was a kind of water shader thing Tessellation with inline GLSL, tessellation using um, Keppel compiling to GLSL, and that's the lot. So none of those crashed, so also good. Last thing I'm going to do is load up a project called Lark, um, which I hope is at the on the right build. Um, yeah, it's on the right branch. Cool. And this is just another project. I just run a bunch of projects before I push any change out to master. It's not a good test suite, but it's better than nothing. I do catch a lot of things that way. Um, Darius saying, what's the state on geometry shaders and Keppel? They're great, as far as I know. <laughs> they work pretty well. 
um, and Tessellation. They both work. Um, Metian saying, beauty, here's the new result. Oh, that sounds positive. Fuck yeah. Okay, so get world to view space, get world model to world to view space. These are now the highest allocating things. Look at that, no consing. That's exactly what I want to see. That is really good. Thanks, Metian, you are a star. Okay, so we... I don't mind what other projects do as far as consing, but I know, need to know that Keppel itself isn't consing at inappropriate times. And that's knocked out one of the places where it was. So that's really good. Um, just to complete the tests, I just need to do this. Lock, run. And then... Um, over here... Whoa, look at that. That's awful. Okay. This was just some PBR stuff I did a long time ago. Um, it's not very easy to see here, so let's put it there. Um, just some material stuff. It's actually incorrect, but I was trying to do it and failed. So anyway, that's just one of the tests. When that works, that exercises a whole bunch of crazy shit um, in the Vario compiler. So that's the one I, I least like breaking because I know that I have to go and do some some crazy, crazy crap. Okay, so... Where have I gone now? Oh, there we go. Oh, yes, do lock stop. In fact, let's just reset everything now. And we'll get back to our project. That is actually the main thing I wanted to look at today, but we are going to do other stuff anyway. I'm kind of open to suggestions on what you want to do. I saw a nice question from JS Jolan, which I'm very interested in. Um, let's just leave this compiling for a bit. Uh, Darius is saying you're, um, the Tailspire blogs are awesome. I'm enjoying reading them a lot. Dude, that's really nice. Thank you. It's nice that they're kind of of interest to someone. I'm trying to make them more than just a day-to-day -day blog. I'm really, oh man, I, I love my job right now. It's really cool. The only part is just knowing that we have to get this done by the end of the year or get something out by the end of this year, which we are really trying to do. I'm pretty sure we can, but it's going to be tight. Um, oh, cool. pondfilm has been seeing them from Twitter as well. That's awesome. All right. JS Jolin was saying, what do you guys think would be the best way of doing Lispy kind of data-oriented design? Um... That is, that is a cool question. And there are a good few parts to it. Um, oh, sorry. I, I, um, I'm just, because it's a quick one, I'm just going to answer Median's question um, on uh, what's the reason for get world view space and get model world space consing. Um, let's just go look at that. Play with verts. Da -da 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 let's go into things, I guess. Um, world to view space. The reason they're consing is um, we've got a quaternion to map four, which is making a new uh, four by four matrix. And then we've got translation, which again is the non-consing version. So it is taking that matrix and then making yet another matrix. We've got negate here, which is taking a vector three and it's the non-consing version. So it's creating another vector three. Um, we're getting the position of the camera, which is just returning, um, yeah, some value. But yeah, there are a bunch of allocations going on here. So we would have to switch those out for some of the um, non-consing versions of those functions. And then we could drop a lot of a lot of stuff. And of course, obviously, this matrix 4 multiply as well. It's the non-consing version, which is really daft. We don't need to use this. Um, but we were just playing, and that's that's nice to do. Just make it fast and then make it fast. Data-oriented design question. Um, Rebel Elder. Late tuning in as usual. Well, it's nice to have you here, man. Don't worry about that. It's just really cool. Um, yes, data-oriented design. So the first part is... Uh, so what does data-oriented design really boil down to? So that's understanding that there is a machine that you're shipping on. Uh, if, like, if you, Basically, it's, it's going to be important if you're shipping product. And you get to decide what finite set of machines you're going to be shipping on. And then you know the characteristics of those machines. And at that point, a lot of the um, kind of undefined behaviors, which are should, which there's a class of undefined behaviors which are undefined, and that's fine. There's a class of undefined behaviors which are actually hardware slash implementation defined. And when you define the hardware and the implementation, they become defined behaviors. They are known behaviors for those platforms. So if you think about C++ and the... Um, the 
uh, overflow of um, signed integers. These things are known on certain platforms, then it's not undefined behavior, but the compiler will still abuse the fact that it's defined as undefined behavior in their compile in uh, in the C++ spec to do things, which is unfortunate. So we decide what kind of hardware we're dealing with, and then we code to the reality of the hardware. Um, the machines are obviously, you know, got that Turing complete, we can do anything, but they obviously are better at certain things, and they have hardware units for doing certain things well. Um, and so a language's ability for us to take advantage of that really boils down to can we shape data? Can we control the shape of data? The data that the mean stuff, which we generally just call data, and the data that does stuff are instructions. Now, Common Lisp actually doesn't give us the most control over that. We have, um, we again, it, it's a lot more interested in being flexible than it is in being specific about layouts and things like that. So when we're trying to control some of this stuff, we might lean for, again, we, we lean for a couple of techniques. Actually, before I dive deeper into that, I would say, of course, that there are. I, I, there's a quote I really like by Sean LaCruth, uh, which goes, efficiency with algorithms, performance with data structures. And it's really good. Um, like your efficiency side is about how can we do less work? And that's what algorithms are all about. Like we're gonna sort some things. What's the most efficient way to sort given some kind of data overall? But big O, um, like, like was it big O notation and stuff like that still has a constant factor and the constant factor matters. Um, so when we get to, once we've whittled down to doing as little as like we're not doing unnecessary things, then it's how do we do what we left to do as fast as possible? And that really depends on hardware and really depends on data structures and layout. Again, we don't have the most control over that. There are things that we can do and there are implementation specific things we can do. I mean, if we want to control where data is, I mean, we can allocate chunks of memory using uh, CFFI and stuff like this. Then we can control of when and where, with, well, where to an extent, but you know what I mean. It's not being moved around by the garbage collector and it's not deleted or allocated unless we tell it to. We can do that in large chunks. I mean, we're not precluded from implementing the kind of things that we, that other people could in other languages once you have raw memory. I mean, you can make your kind of, um, you know, slab allocators and linear allocators, stuff like this, you can make those. And in your project, like if there are set lifetimes, there's a lot of things that once you get down to a single project, there are kind of known quantities and you can do things more precisely. So yeah, there's, there's, a, lot to, there's a lot to think about there. Um, one of the things I really want to do, and this is a project that is on a very slow burn, but I have designs for, is I want to be able to define tables of data so there's a, there's a lot of places in um say like an entity component system inside a game again i'm coming from a I, i'm thinking about it from the game side because i see some interesting problems there um like the people are writing c and c plus plus for a reason it's the right tool for that job because it allows you to control that this kind of stuff that they care about it's very important i mean c plus plus because of the ecosystem but really c you like there's good reasons not to dive deep into um, the kind of uh, C++ standard library and things like this if you're really caring about performance. But where was I going with that? Um, yes, controlling data and things like this. Um, yeah, there's a space where there's a lot of smart people. They're doing things a certain way for a reason. If I think that I can do it in this language, then I've got to kind of address the realities of, uh, of what's actually going on. So what I'd like to do is be able to, um, oh yeah, that was it. That was to do with um, data. Like in, in the game side of things, it seems to me at least like there are, there are a good few places where you end up with systems with large data structures and you're working with large numbers of things. The working with one thing at a time is the degenerate case. So you really wanna be thinking about processing large numbers of things. In that case, I start thinking of um, databases and data transforms and things like this. I really want to be able to have large, um, much more granular kind of, sorry, much more um, coarse um, garbage collection um, to the point where I can say, okay, this is going to last a frame or this is going to last n frames or this is going to tie to this thing or it's managed by a custom allocator and stuff like this. 
Um, I want to do that, and I want to do uh, SIMD um, processing over that data. And I'd like to obviously write things in Lisp. I want to keep things interactive. And that's one of the problems when we're doing stuff in Lisp, when we're trying to be more performant, I suppose. Um, we're generally reaching for functions rather than uh, general functions, rather than dynamic, so rather than generic, like regular functions rather than dynamic functions. We don't have the dispatch overhead and we're using structs where possible because again, it gives the compiler more chance to know the types of things at call sites, inline more things, infer more things, all of which help the compiler do a better job. Um, I wanna make a little language, statically typed query language for processing that data. And I then want to, because we'll have more restrictions on the data um, and the kind of processing you can do, we can make an optimizing compiler that works on that and makes things really fast. Yeah, that's, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. I've got a design for how the system might work. Um, I've been working on a library called Checkmate, uh, which is a library to allow people to write static type checkers in Common Lisp. Um, I'm then testing that by starting to make the query language. Um, I've been doing a few things to be able to get CPU topology information on Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, yeah, there's, there's parts and I don't expect to be able to do it for another year or so yet because again, Tailspire is the most important thing right now that I get that out the door. Um, even more important than doing uh, the Lisp stuff, which I love. So that's kind of where we are. But um, I really think there is there are opportunities there. And the reason, one of the, I, I need to look into CCL more, but one of the things we do have um, with SBCL, like again, we're talking about re restricting the number of possibilities. And when it comes to games, the users, the players of your game, do not give a flying fuck in general about what implementation you used to make the game. They don't care about the language. They don't care about the implementation. They don't care if your project is portable between implementations. So if it allows you to ship, pick something. Don't change your compiler halfway through the project. Pick something. So again, I look at the Steam hardware survey and it says everyone, again, in general, I know this doesn't apply for all games, but it's pretty much 100% of people on there have a 64-bit architecture that supports SSC2 and SSC3, right? That means we can pretty much guarantee that's there. We can address that, which means we can use those features. And SBCL, great compiler that it is, has, um, um, gives you access to emit your own assembly code, and you can do that for emitting SIMD instructions. They're all in there. They just be, need to be used. In fact, if you find libraries like, I'm off on a rant now, so I'm gonna be going for a while. Uh, right, if we go and find SBCGA, which is not to do with um, SBCL specifically, it's just, put, it's just unfortunately named. Um, this is a maths library, which I didn't know about when I started RTG math. Um, but for SBCL, it defines some VOPs, virtual, uh, what do they call them? Um, is it virtual operations? I can't actually remember what VOP stands for in this uh, case. But they do, they use the SIMD instructions, which are available in your machine, um, if supported, and they use it to optimize their vector adds and multiplies and deletes and all that kind of stuff. So this stuff is accessible, right? We've got things there. This mechanism is very underdocumented, um, so it, it's taken me a long time and I'm, I'm still absolute noob at it. Um, I, I spent a weekend kind of trying to pull out information. Um, yeah, um, it seems possible. It seems like we have, we have the FFI stuff so we can allocate memory and do that kind of stuff. Um, like when you're using CFFI as well, like when you specify like, CFFI, um, I don't know, mem, aref, uh, pointer, and the type is int, and it's the 10th one, right? When we expand this and keep expanding it, you see it comes down to just a signed, um, yeah, basically, yeah, dereference and get a signed 32-bit number um, from a pointer and given a byte offset. 
and this compiles down pretty well like um when you yeah when when you compile this and you look at the disassembly with the right optimization flags turned on and things like this you're getting roughly the the instruction you would expect i mean spcl is a really good compiler um but it's not great at vectorizing things for the same reason that any language would struggle vectorizing things which is just there isn't the information there to be able to do it when you put constraints on the data um and the way that you can process it you give yourself a bunch more information and then you can use macros which are com just compilers they're just functions from one language to another um then you have an opportunity there to do some stuff and with sbcl at least and probably with other ones as well um, we have an opportunity to omit the instructions in the shape that we want as well so i think there's a possibility of doing it i might be massively wrong um yeah yeah, that's, that's kind of where my head is with that as well. But I'm really stoked about the idea of doing it. I really want to do more stuff, which is just getting chunks of the programming problem, um, chunks of data into, into that um, unmanaged space, or at least managed by my library and using the information that that library would have given its restrictions. What else? I had some other thoughts on that kind of stuff but yeah it's really exciting it's really exciting that we, we have a dynamic language which has the capability of doing this um really anything that you know you ever you have a language which also like if you shipped llvm with your language we, it would be the same kind of situation right you've got a compiler framework and you can emit code and compile it and link to it and all this kind of stuff there's a lot of a lot of cool things um Okay, so, right, we got some questions here because I've been ranting for a while. Um, the blog, so uh, Celeste is asking for the link to the blog. That is techsnuffle.com, and Darius has linked that just below. That's great. Um, thank you, and the latest post, yep. Um, Lolblock, has someone new arrived? What am I... Hello, am I seeing OpenCL things? No, this is, um, we're normally doing a lot of GL stuff. Let's uh, just get some graphics up because it's just wrong not to have it. Uh, play with Burt's play. Let's just start this, put it over there and give it a second while things load in very slowly because we're still using Ascent and we're using it in a fairly slow way. Um, we pull all the data into Lisp and then we kick bits off of it to the bits of it off to the GPU and uh, yeah wait a second oh we're probably not seeing anything because we removed all the rendering code wait a second we commented loads of stuff out because we were trying to understand where some allocations were going so let's get this back again um, Oof. And it's probably not happy about that. That's all right. We'll fix it up real soon. Might just need to recompile after all that, um, all that stuff. Yeah. Let's. It's going to be rather than chasing down whatever weirdy state we've got into. I'm just going to do a quick restart, which is not the lispy way, but will do for now. Um. So yes, we're doing some uh, Lisp OpenGL stuff. And yeah, <laughs> Darius, I'm not sure about the rest of your sentence. The first part was factually correct, but everything between the parens is a, a problem. Um, Pongapim says, can you say the name again of the guy who said um, efficiency in the algorithms? It was Sean LeCaruth, yes. And it was, um, it was one of his talks at... I think it was CPPCon. Um, there's, a, there's a good few talks there. He's talking about performance and C++ and things like that. Yeah, um, I love watching CPPCon talks because I really don't want to write C++. And it's just such a great way of catching up with years and years of people, like giving you years of experience that you would otherwise have to sweat through. I have no desire to do that most of the time. Let's drop down to our little object that looked cool. So, um, 
let's have a look. Do, do, do. Let's find some code. Right. So, where were we? Um, Lolblock, if you are still here, which I'm not sure you would be after, when well, say, doing graphics and lists, most people would run, um, just to give an idea of what we're doing. Um, we have a library called Keppel. Um, it does some um, Lisp to GLSL cross compilation, and it's designed to make GL feel Lispy, and also play well with kind of interactive style programming. And what it allows us to do are things like um, take this code, which is defun, like so normally functions are written defun, then the name, then the arguments, then the body. With defun g, it says we want this to be a GPU function. So all of this is going to get translated to GLSL and run on the GPU. Um, and then we compose these functions together to form a pipeline, and that's what we map data over, and that's how we render stuff. So if I go in here and I just replace like this down here with some color, it's gone away because I've made it transparent. But now you can see that it's a red object, and we can set the transparency to be 0.5, and now it's translucent, which isn't showing very well on the stream. Let's try and make it a bit less. Uh, yeah, now you can kind of see through it. Um, yeah, so it's an it's a kind of cool toy to allow us to cool library to allow us to do interesting things um, with GL. Now that it's actually behaving differently. Oh yeah, because we have a couple of versions of this function. So if I do this, we get back to the version we had before, and so it just really allows us to play interactively with stuff, and that's cool, or at least we seem to think so. Let's see what else is going on. Um, That's fantastic. Pom to Pimps linked a PDF with the um, to do with that talk. I highly recommend if you're uh, more of a kind of shit sticks in my head really well for some reason when I'm watching videos. Um, it's something to do with um, stories. I seem to be able to retain stories very well. Um, so a lot of video talks really help me a lot. Um, we've got a little bit of weirdness going on over here again. What the f uh, we've seen that before. Strange. Mainly see it when I've been swatch switching screens, though. I wonder if it's something to do, something getting um, hung up when I'm on the other machine to do with input. It's really annoying because it happens so infrequently, I can't get a profiler on it to see what's going on. Um, C++ is nuts, though. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> everything between the friends is a problem that is a good quote I like that um, that must be the generic name of these episodes fucking yes <laughs> uh, when it comes to Keppel I put everything between the friends so it's all my bloody fault there are quite a few great CPPCon talks there really are it's really great as well if you if pick it like if you have an interest like Find the conferences where that's um, of high importance and then watch the talks where they're talking about how they struggle at it. So like C++ is meant to be like, oh, performance is like, you just get performance. You're doing low-level programming. Things go fast. So the performance talks there are especially insightful because you're looking like, here's the language where you're meant to be able to do this and people are still failing. Why? And that's really cool. Um... That's sweet. Okay, so Pontipim saying talking about stories video. This one is great. I'm just gonna link this one in here. And have a look at this. Papers we love. Oh yeah, William Bird. I actually have have watched that talk. That is cool. Um, it's just fun. He's an he's an excitable guy, so it's really cool to see this stuff. Let's have a quick check. Did check did uh did Lol Block stay around? He did. Or well, she did. Well done. <laughs> you have, you've taken the first step into madness. Okay, so now... I'm sorry, it's a bit of a weird episode to come in on, actually, because normally we would do something like this. We'll pick a pick some kind of graphical effect that we can possibly do in two hours, and then we try and bash it out. Um, but today we were looking a little bit at profiling at, at a performance issue. And I can see it freezing again. I just have that horrible feeling that's related to the garbage collector. And I really don't like the fact that we had some, when we were profiling, like every few frames we were still getting ambient stuff. Oh, that's a fucking freeze. What is that? What is going on? Uh, 
will be a good way of doing this. Um, yeah, let's do with profiling and let's run, I don't know, 5,000 frames? That'll take a while. Um, we don't want allocations necessary necessarily. What's the default for this anyway? Oh, slime, enable, concurrent, hints. Go on, wake up. What's going on here? Oh, okay. Oh, that's why it doesn't exist. So if I do require, come on, require sbprof. Nope, sbsprof. Come on. Oh yeah, because I haven't typed anything for mode. Okay, now now this is working. Mode is sampling mode. So what's the default sampling mode? Um, sbsprof, and we're looking for well, that's sampling interval. Alloc interval. Oh. Sampling mode. What's the default? CPU. Okay, yes, that is what we want. So that's fine. We can just remove this and say default and say start. Um, and we'll let that run for a second. And I'm actually going to fly down there. and Because it was a lot easier to spot when it was here. I just wanted to freeze like that. But was that to do with this ending? No. Oh, we got a freeze. Oh, thank fuck. Okay, so hopefully that'll show up. Like Metagan saying, could it be a GC? It definitely could be a GC. But I I didn't see this start happening until recently. Like, I, I, there have been times where Keppel has, l like, allocated a lot more than it is now, right? Like... Frame to frame, we're not allocating that much. Like in the, like we're we're, well, we're doing plenty actually. Yeah, there is quite a bit being allocated. But I, basically, I've done dumber projects, right? I and I've not seen this kind of um, this kind of freeze. I guess I guess the five thousand frames is going to take a while. We'll just leave it running. That's not a problem. Um, A freeze, come on, quick, cool metagan. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Oh, here we go. Let's have a look. Okay, so this is a little different. The samples now are about basically which function was executing at that point. So this isn't about allocations. This is about other stuff. Um, we got a good few samples over, well, the sampling time was four, 14 seconds. There was a lot of other time as well. Um, you know what? It might actually be more helpful to, for me to use my profiler that I use. I have for Keppel because that has a lot more precise times and can see into a lot shorter functions. It's just got a... The, the timing accuracy on SBCL is uh, milliseconds, I think, still. So it's not great for this. Um, but. So that's the number of times sampling woke up inside the function itself is self. Um, so it mostly work, woke up inside this, which is getting, which is setting some element of this, which is okay, fine, apparently. Because we make a lot of, we make a lot of uh, transform matrices. So that still makes sense. Async pipeline is still up here, but that makes sense that it would be taking some time. Again, that's what we're trying to run most frequently. So uh, we don't do any batching, so we're just calling this a whole bunch of times. This is our pipeline that's doing the actual rendering. Um, low block saying maybe use too many registers so it's been written to global memory <laughs> I mean yeah I mean like we're kind of not in control of that bit unfortunately um, like well or fortunately yeah probably fortunately 
like uh, the register allocation isn't down to us it uh, it does bother me how big the block of code is um that's doing the evaluate like that's doing the um dispatch but most of the stuff is necessary it's like setting uniforms and all that kind of crap it would be nice to make it shorter but i don't think that's the problem again like i've run this i run a lot of this stuff before and i haven't seen this I haven't seen that kind of freeze when playing with the toys i tell you what it could be actually is that um is um Compton. um oops oh is I think it's spelled like that. Let's let's just check. If I turn it on here and do Compton, yeah, there's Compton. And I do this, turn it off. It could be related to that because there is that compositor and we don't really know how it's interacting with things. I think I use it a lot when I'm doing, I've done other stuff, but who knows? Um, but there's matrix multipliers again, seal opening up GL check error. Yes, that's gonna be run a lot, that makes sense. Unity truncate. You know what? I, I think I am going to get the um, Keppel performance thing out because that would definitely catch a large uh, spike, I think. Right, so to do that, so let's see. I don't even know if this stuff still works. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, let's see how it used to be done. Keppel.perf. Nope. Um... Yeah, so I split this out. Is there anything I need to load first? No, I think I load this first. Kevl.perf. And then I tell it to load with instrumentation. I think that's all I need to do. I've done this before, but obviously. I've no, was done it before I wrote it, but I mean, I think I've done it on the stream as well. Okay, so the perf provider is going to be SDL2. That means it's going to use uh, the SDL2 timing function, um, which is fine because we're using SDL2 already, so it makes a lot of sense. And it's going to use all tags. You can specify tags on um, the functions that you might want to profile, and then it can basically only profile the ones with the tags you're interested in. But we're going to say all. This is going to recompile Keppel with profiling enabled. Um, hopefully this will work. Yeah, so I can show you what this actually does. It's super hacky because it was what was happening was I was working on making a Keppel backend for what was the project called? It was Vid's um, sketch project, which is great. And we um, were doing a bunch of work there. And it was great because it showed so many places where Keppel was bad. Um, it was a really good test case. And so I had to write a profiler for that because, again, like we've seen, the profiler that we've got is cool. Um, but its accuracy is low and it didn't wake up in a lot of the... I had a lot of functions which are very, very short execution time but where it was mattering. Like they were doing an allocation, they were doing something um, and it really added up so I needed something a bit more precise. Okay, so now we've got that, we should be able to just load um, Play With Verts. What I'll do is I'll go to Keppel quickly and show what that has done to all the functions that have been marked so if we take um uh, da, 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 profile so let's look at the stencil so here's a function that does some shit um do we have a smaller one no there's a lot to do um oh, that's a just an ugly example but all right I specify profile and any tags here, um, and then Defum will expand this slightly differently. What happens is at the top um, of this function, it now has a log profile event. Um, it gets the current time, and this function is has been numbered 58. What happens is behind the scenes, there's a big uh, hash table that while everything was compiling, it took the names of the functions and it gave them an ID. That was it. And that's the ID we use here. Then log profile event 
um, takes these two values, grabs a pre-allocated um, buffer, um, and I think it's a, uh, how big is it? It's probably a two meg buffer or something like this allocated with the FFI. Um, we, yeah, get the current buffer. We get the current buffer position. And then we use memref to write um, the time and the um, ID into that memory, into that big buffer. And then once the buffer is full, um, we've crossed whatever this is. Oh yeah, so it's a 500 and, um, oh, it's only a, it's really only a 500K buffer? Sure, fine. Once it's um, gone over the max number of elements, it um, takes that buffer and throws it into a queue off to another thread. And that all that thread does is it receives buffers and it writes them out to disk and then it throws the buffer back in so it can be reused. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. So it's pretty simple, um, but then what's nice is it's only got two IDs that it's writing in each time. So it's relatively quick. It's a lot better than writing in strings, for example. So now that's done for all of those functions, we will load up play with verts and we will run it for some frames. And uh, yeah. You shouldn't be noticing a frame drop when it compiles because the streaming is done on a different computer. It's a bit weird. Um, after all this, I hope we see the problem again. I kind of hope we don't, though, because then we can put it down to Compton. I really hope it's Compton, you know? But it might be GC. The problem with this profiler is, again, it's only about how long a function took to run, not why it's slow, not allocations, not anything like that. I have no idea how to get that information. But I might go look at this... Um, Swank monitor thing that uh, Median's talking about because they've obviously got some information, way to access information there, and I'd love to attach this to this. There's oh, there's some other things we need to talk about as well, which would be really cool. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. And package play with verts. Play start. Why did I do that? I can just do anyway. Cool. Right. Start, start, start. And then we are gonna go to temp. which will be important soon. Reset FBOs. All right, let's bring the REPL up. And we are gonna start dumping a lot of data. And that's the thing, We I really wanted to get a lot of data out of this. Um, this is just very high frequency. So the file size is gonna grow pretty fucking fast. So keppel.perf um, start profiling. And apparently it'll limit it to 400 megabytes, but how, whether that works or not, we'll see. So now if we tap this, we will see this number increasing pretty rapidly. Um, but this is still running at an okay, yeah, well, I'm not sure what the frame rate is because this effect is actually based on number of seconds, not uh, anything else. So we can see we're at 200 meg now. We're just gonna let it run. Which is pretty good. I, I wanted something where we could still be interactive even though we're recording every single function um, call, at, like entrance and exit. Perf thread shut down, destructor found, profiling stop. Awesome. Okay, so now we have a 400 meg odd file. And this is the slow bit, which is really funny. Um, the analyze. I think that's all we need to do. Temp perf, map perf, temp perf, yeah. Oh yeah, actually there's a perf map. I think this is the map between, yeah, there we go. These are all the function names to their IDs. Um, so this is everything that was inspected. Um, and this bit's slow. Darius says, I don't think it's Compton. It's bad for performance since it will buffer stuff, but those freezes seem unrelated. Oh! Um, CB, 3B has a nice, very nice uh, feature in his. Okay. I guess that wasn't exactly what, there was a thing. Overview. You take the analyze results and you throw them into overview. Keppel.perf. Overview that. Okay, cool. Right. 
So, you know what? I'm so busy nattering, I didn't watch to see if we got a freeze during that time. Anyway, where do we spend time? Like, so there's a per frame frequency. So this upload function was called a thousand times uh, per frame. Really? A thousand times per frame? You nuts? That can't be right, surely. Wow. Saying roughly, no, well that can't. Okay, so per frame frequency. So it took the, yeah, it's average number of times per frame this was called. That's quite a lot. I mean, we've got quite a, we've got a few objects, but, uh, what was it, things. It's only 400 objects. And this is uploading, 1F is just one float, right? Hmm. That is more than I expected. Okay. I suppose actually we have a lot of draw calls. And yeah, we have 400. And this is like three draw calls each. Why would that be? No, this is, okay, so it'd be 400. Let's look at render. Okay, wait a second. No, we've got, like this one, for example, takes a float right here. Um, the vertex stage, no, that would be the same. Oh no, that's called scale. I don't think it's scale down here. Is it? No, so that's, that's two floats already. So we'd only need one more float somewhere in this pipeline, which I bet there is, uh, because we have our blur, for example. Um, and that would account for three calls per 400 three floats per 400 draw calls yeah totally possible same again here like we've got a few a few matrices uploaded per thing definitely definitely in in realms of uh believability setting which vao is bound uh, we do that a whole bunch of times um that's interesting actually Oh no, yeah, we would call that function that many times, but Keppel might not actually bind the VAO that many times. And the reason would be if it's already bound, it's not gonna bound it, bind it again. Um, do let me know if you see that thing freeze anytime soon. Sorry, I'll... I'll uh... So again, this is the most interesting frequency rise, but most of these have a very low cost. And then this is the thing with the highest cost per call on average. And it's swap, which makes sense, and also step. This is the function that goes and tells whatever the, the host to Keppel is to update its internal stuff, which more, normally means pump uh, input events. Definitely does here. And then we've got... Okay, so what's um, what the profiler also does is it has profile points inside all of, um, all of our pipelines. So if we go to like... The, where is it? Like dissolve pipeline, for example. Inside here, it doesn't just profile the entire um, function. It does do that. But it also profiles individual blocks inside this function. Um, and so this block here is the part of this pipeline which is uploading uniforms. So this is significant, right? And what we would do if we cared about this um, is that on the first call, we would set up the uniforms and then we would not set them for all the other calls. We actually did this on other streams before um, where we just, um, yeah, because uniforms are essentially memoized between calls. So that would be fine. Again, I would expect some cost here. So that's all right. Um, I can't remember what the units are in for this. Um, Okay, so yeah, this is uh, most expensive per call on average. So uh, the, yeah, this pipeline has the most uniforms probably, so it's up there. Clear FBO is taking us a significant amount of time. That's good to know. Um, and then we can see other pipelines. The anti-aliasing pipeline, the dissolve pipeline, kind of what we'd expect there to be time taken. Like we'd expect them to be expensive on their own, but it depends how many times they're called. Like, just like this is, you can't just base it off this because this just tells you how many times it's called, right? And this just tells you 
uh, how expensive each call is, but it only happens once. Like this only happens once. It's not really a big deal for us. Um, and then I, I do need to know what the units were for this though. I think it was nanoseconds. Okay, yeah, so we're getting it in nanoseconds. Um, I think anyway. Yeah, so some of these are expensive. A good chunk of a millisecond up here and stuff like that. Um, I think that's right. I'll have to look into that because mm, dipping these point numbers, I'm not really sure. I want to go look at that again because I'm not convinced. Kevl perf perf import. So it's getting the number of ticks per nanosecond. And then we get, I guess this is the number of ticks, and we divide it by the number of ticks per nanosecond, which would give us the number of nanoseconds. Do we do anything else with that? I guess not. Maybe it is nanoseconds then. Okay. Things are fast. Um, so yeah, so then we've got this section called interesting functions, which is basically when you have a high... Um, High number of calls per frame and a high cost per call. Basically, and it gives you amount of uh, frame time as well that's taken up in total, which is a less useful number, but it's there anyway. So again, th these are the things that if I was wanting to look into why things are slow, this is where I'd start. So again, pipelines. The draw takes some time. The draw is relatively expensive given we do it nearly 400 times a frame um, and the uniform upload. But we kind of expect that, so we're not too desperately worried about that now. I do want to look into it, though. Um, set sampler bound. Binding samplers. That makes sense that that would happen. Uh, the uniform uploads themselves. Yes, this is all. This stuff is going to be called from inside of these blocks. Um, setting the VAO bound. That's going to be happening inside the pipeline as well. Current viewport. That's interesting that that's taking a significant amount of time and we're doing it enough. Yep, so I mean, you see this is happening twice a frame. So I'm guessing, um, hmm, that's interesting actually. Does that mean we're unbinding the VAO on every call? I guess we have to actually, because if you don't unbind the VAO, then... Ugh. Yeah, if you don't unbind the VAO, then you... Then the next buffer that's mapped is going to get added to that VAO state, which is very annoying. But this also means that we've we've got a lot of GL state changes there when we don't really want that. Um, it would be nice to be able to avoid that. So basically say for an entire block, use one buffer stream. We could do this using the multi-draw indirect stuff we've looked at. But that's also a later GL version, so I wouldn't really want to have to do that. Let's just look at render for a second. We take this pipeline and we expand it, and then we just look for uh, whatever that function was called, which was VAO bound. Okay, we can see with VAO bound is going on here, and it's wrapped around this entire block. Oh no, that's... Uh, when is this being used? This is inside... Yeah, this looks like it's inside the draw block. Okay, yep. Yeah, so this is wrapped around this whole thing. So if we go into with VAO bound, we look here. It is taking whatever the VAO is to begin with, and then it sets it back to it at the end of the block. And if we go to VAO bound, set VAO bound, um, we are looking at the current VAO binding, and we're not doing it unless it's different. Um, 
but seen as the VAO at the beginning of the block could well be zero, in fact it probably is zero, and then we are setting it at the end of the block, that is going to be different, which means it is going to be binding and unbinding on every call. Okay, so... I want to look into if we can specify for a block that you don't have to unbind the VAO again. Um, what you could do actually, would that work? Yeah, I think you could already do this. Because if you have um, with, sorry, I'm going to get back to the chat in a second, with VAO bound, uh, whatever it is. And you bound some VAO. Ugh. Then for the rest of that block, that's set. Now, any call to map G in there to some pipeline is going to try and set um, the buffer stream. And then it's going to try and unmap the buffer stream at the end, back to whatever it was before. But if this was already bound, then it wouldn't bind it at the beginning because it's already set to the thing it wants to be and it wouldn't revert it to what it was at the end because it's already what it needs to be so this roughly would work so then we would need to say with buffer stream bound or something like this because we wrap our VAOs up in buffer stream so I'm going to add a feature for that um, have we had any lag I haven't seen it for a bit, I must admit. But I have been staring at this side of the screen, and it's a rather big screen. So, I don't know. Um, have you guys seen anything? Right, let's uh, have a look at Keppel again. Let's add a new issue and say, add a way to um, avoid uh, rebinding of BAO in blood block of map g calls um, with buffer stream bound awesome. um, this would be what should we say Because one thing we could do is we could um, have some flag in the context that only works on like a debug build or something like this, where you could specify with the buffer stream bound, which is going to set the VAO for that entire block. And we have anything that would bind the buffer. If that flag is set inside, then we throw an error. Um, because then you'll be accidentally changing the state of the VAO, which you don't want to do. That's interesting. Pom to Pimp saying no freeze. Occlusion or slowness, but definitely no freezing. Seen nothing. Interesting. Okay. Hmm. Well, that's still an open question then. Let's have a look at some of these other ones, see if there's anything else. And this is generally how I've got like Keppel to be reasonably kind of speedy, I guess. Like it's not heinous. Um, it's still got way more overhead than I'd like, but you know, for a for a list library, I, I think it's I think it's okay. I think it's okay. Um, so we got down to setting the VAO bound. This is something we can do something about, and I want to look into that. We do something similar actually for transform feedback buffers because it's illegal to, um, or at least, oh, how does it work? There's something to do with nested binding of transform feedback buffers, which are not allowed on earlier versions of OpenGL. And so we do have some detection mechanisms for that. So I can look into that because it was actually quite satisfying how it worked. Um, yeah, because it could get in some ugly states otherwise. I was really happy with that. Set drawer FBO bound. So we're binding FBOs a whole bunch of times. We could avoid that. That's a very interesting one. 
So when we're setting the... Really? So we're doing that 168 times per... Fr no. Yeah, 168 times per frame. Again, that's one that definitely should be... Um, like, amortized, it should be, like, it shouldn't be too much, but still could be a lot of changes going on. Wonder where those are. I mean, technically, you can do you can do thousands and thousands of draw calls per frame in GL, but it's more just that this is, there is some overhead here, and I just want to know what it is. Um, grep with FBO. Okay, so it's all in this file. With FBO bound. Oh yeah, here it is. Um, no, this is only... Oh no, we're doing 40 passes on the... Um... Yes, our bloom is pretty uh, is pretty stupid right now. We don't... We could do the lower... Like the, the wider blooms. Like we could do those on lower resolution. We can downsample the scene and then do the bloom on that. And then add like additively blend it back to the full size scene, which we're not doing. Which means we're, we're doing a whole bunch of iterations here. Um, so we're doing 40 wow this is really stupid though look we do current FBO clear FBO okay so we're switching the FBO each time that's why we're having to do that okay alright so I guess it's kind of unavoidable we're going to have a lot of calls to that but that's fine okay so that explains a bunch of those, where those calls are coming from, at least. Um, clear FBO, there's a lot of calls to that. And again, generally calls to change GL state are quite expensive. Also, we've got things that, like Kevl introduces some overhead there as well. Um, yeah, another pipeline with a lot fewer uniforms, so it was a faster call. Um, draw FBO bound. Yep, that's fine. So that's querying, which is the other half of this. Ah, so the fact that that's... See, this is setting no GL state. This is just going to fetch the information. So cost per call is 0 0.7 nanoseconds, apparently. But we're doing it enough times that it matters over all the frames. Um, oh, I guess this is frame time. So number of calls per frame, cost per call... Oh, wow, this is the cost per frame. Okay, so we're talking like seven... Seven milliseconds? No, that can't be right. Really? There's no... Wait, wait a second, nanoseconds. So that's... Nanoseconds is like billionths of a second, though. So... No. So this is 7,000... Yeah, so it's... 0.7 of a millisecond is still... Hmm, okay. Might have got that wrong in my head, but whatever. Let's, uh... We'll keep trucking for now. We're getting down to less... There's a certain point as well that the inaccuracy of the timer comes in. So when you when you look at the bottom of, like, um... Yeah, per call cost, things down here start all roughly costing the same. 0.7! Everything is 0.7, 0.8, 0.8. That's probably bullshit. We're just at the limit of what it can actually reasonably give us information about. So I kind of ignore the bottom ones anyway. Um, okay, now here are some other things that are annoying. So, current viewport getting that information is has some cost. And it's being done a lot. So that might be something we want to try and speed up, but I think... <sighs> yeah, this is a tricky one, actually, because it's pretty much just getting the value from the context. There's not too much stuff I can do there about that, I think. Um, so what is this? Current viewport. Yeah. No, no, there's a big old struct and there's just a value and then it needs to be pulled out and we do as much as we can I think to to optimize that 
not really sure what else we can do. I mean, we've declared all the types, we've declared it to be inline, we've set speed to be up. I mean, we do know the type, but we don't know that people are going to pass in the right thing here. So we really do want the safety to still be on. It's a user facing function. Is it user facing function? No, it's got this percentage sign here. What is calling it? Because if it's called from something where we can guarantee that the types, it's going to be safe, like who calls this? It's called by current viewport, which is this function here. And this is the name of the variable, this is the type, and this is what it defaults to if not specified. So it should always be um, a Keppel context. Let's just see what the type is here. Okay, so we can be or Keppel context. So yeah, Keppel context or null. But then we check here. We say it's a either it's either do this. Oh wait, really? Huh? We say all of that or no current viewport found. Huh. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not say I'm not happy with uh, turning that to be non-safe. So no, can't squeeze anything out there um, for now. Let's have a look at what's going on. Um, Median saying, "What is that Compton thing? Maybe activate it again now that we haven't seen the freezes." Yeah, I, I think I will. Um, See, switching between this machine and that machine, like that machine and this machine, occasionally slows things down. That was the other thing that was happening a lot, actually. I was on, I was on my streaming machine, and I wasn't here. Let's just give it a second and see what happens. Um, if you're using a window manager instead of the desktop environment, you usually don't get a compositor. All these things that Darius mentioned just now are desktop environments. Back as you're using stump window manager, which a uh, stump yeah stump w one, which is just a window manager. It doesn't have a lot of functionality, so I've got Compton running to go with it uh, to do compositing. Yes, that's correct. And there is there are warnings, right? Like there there is stuff. Um, if you I see that when I switch over, I do get a little hang there, which is interesting. Um, Compton Compositor. I've spelled that wrong, but whatever. Okay. Come on, Chris. There we go. Right. There's a backend GLX, and I'm pretty sure there were some warnings about that. Oh no, maybe they're gone. Because when I first installed this, ah, right, so GL, let's just look at GL in general. Um, the performance of blur under X render backend might be pretty bad. Open GL backend could be faster. Wow, I guess things have come along because before there were some big fat warnings saying, GL really doesn't like, oh, it's really fragile. Um, so I don't know. Vsync does not work too well. You can check the Vsync guide to, to get possibly better effects. I have turned Vsync off for this stuff, but I don't know. Um, I guess one thing we could do is just go in here and just say um, freeze. Also, we don't know which version of Compton is in um, uh, Debian. So it might be a version that still has bugs. And that would be fair. Like, I, I, I fucking love Compton. It's really cool. Um, so if we do apps, uh, what is it for? Is it just apt info? No, apt on the page. Uh, da, 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 list, no, search, show, show package details. Okay, let's do that. That looks uh, early. But I don't know. Not point one beta two. 
0.1 beta. Oh, it's beta 2. It's the latest release. But that was 2013. Um, so, and it's there's been a lot of dev since 2013. Okay, so it might be worth me... Um, oh, yeah, wait a second. I'm going to be with this on. Sorry, I forgot about that. Um, hmm. Okay, we might not get the answer to this today. We're just going to have to do some ambient testing and see what happens. Okay, so kill that. Yes, and let's just have a look at uh, a few more things in here. Small freeze, are you the only one? Uh, I got it on Switch for sure. Um, but thanks, Bond Pimp, for the app show. That's cool. Okay, so here is where we're getting down to accesses into structs being, a, being like measured. And I think some of these things are just uh, like. Well, yeah, all this is doing is accessing the struct. I think the only overhead here is the fact that this is profiled. Like, there's really nothing we can do about the performance of a struct access, so I really should just remove this. Um, yeah, I, I really should just remove this. I can do that another time. Um, but yeah, now we're getting down into... We're getting down to that point where straight up just calling the accessor into a struct and getting a value out is taking a bunch of time and we are down to yeah stuff we don't really need to worry about so let's just have a look through what it is active texture nums current viewports um uniform 1b again uniform 1b was one of the high frequency functions it was one ones that was called so many times so when we can see that its call cost is quite low um, actually, no, we're, yeah, calling it 40 times a frame. So, you know, it probably adds up. Okay. So, I hope, I hope some of that was interesting. That's the uh, Keppel Profiler stuff. One thing, in order to get rid of all that profiling stuff, you need to kill the session and then load, uh, load um, your project again. Um, and you need to load it as in ASDF uh, load system force T because otherwise um, because we've just compiled a load of instrumentation into your into your project um, so we need to recompile everything to get rid of it again um, yeah that's uh, that's basically oh shit that's actually the end of the stream huh okay so that's actually really good timing um, we'll just do that then to make sure that we've uh, got rid of everything I was just wrapping up the subject I didn't realize we're actually at the end of the stream as well so that's cool so let's load oh no I didn't follow my own advice ASDF load system play with a force. And I don't know, does that force everything? Okay, could not find this. No. Let's do force all. What? Okay. Really? Ah, okay, let's just, let's load Keppel first. Like I say, a lot of this stuff is janky because I made the profiler for me and it's never been, it's never been cleaned up enough to be used by humans, um, which is fine. Again, I'm more than happy for people to use it, but it's not something I support as being, uh, yeah. Seriously strange. Okay, I mean, I've never, I, I haven't seen this before. Post recompile, but oh, you're such a bird, Chris. T, not colon, colon T. There we go. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Now everything's recompiling again. So massive thanks to Matian as well for um, telling us about Swank Monitor, which is something we're going to have to look into in another stream for sure. Um, it seems like there's some really cool, uh, yeah, allocation stuff there. 
Um, what we'll do on the next stream is remind me not to use Compton <laughs> on that stream, and we'll see if we get any hangs. And um... ooh, what the fuck? Oh no, this is all. This is warnings and play with that. Okay, that's fine. I thought it was warnings from some other project. Um. So yeah, we'll, um, I'm not sure what we're going to do next week, um, but we will let's just make this not shit. But we will play with something, as usual. Um, yeah. If any of you guys have any ideas, do let me know. Um, obviously, we're kind of bound by the two-hour time limit and also by... You know, like just mental overhead and stuff like this. But I, I always love the suggestions. If we can't do it one week, we can always queue it up for another week. If it's something massive, we could always plan to do like a marathon stream one time. Um, Darius is saying, but you use Compton for converting black and white on the other streams too, right? Yeah, I did. We've actually been seeing these freezes for quite a few episodes. Um, I don't know when it started, um, but I have noticed it. The problem is, I used to use uh, Compton on Debian with Stump Window Manager, and then I moved over to Ubuntu using Stump Window Manager. There could be something that's changed that I fucked up or something like this. So I'm not really sure. Um, Meta the Man, yeah. Dan Levitan. Oh, man, I need to watch Good Morning Vietnam again. Anyway, that seems to be it. I'm happy to take any last minute questions, and then I'm going to flee. Uh, I'll give you 30 seconds. While we look at the pretty thing. Ooh. There's a lot of stuff we need to revisit. Actually, there's one thing I will tell you about. And that is, I would love to take a project like Remotary. Or like um, Microprofiler. What's it called? Microprofile? What's it called? Yeah, Microprofile. I'm sticking the links in the corner. Um and what would be really cool to do is take those c libraries because they're very simple compile them and wrap them and um they are actually i should bring it up on here because it's no good just yep that freeze there was me switching machines sorry right so these projects are profilers that you can um put in and then the results are piped out to your web browser um so then it, yeah it buffers things up and dumps them out to the web browser this would be a really cool tool it would be lovely to get basically to put this stuff um in place of what i have um and or maybe i don't know and this just looks really cool and it's obviously written by people with some skill which is really nice um so that would be better than my hackery there's a uh, micro profile and remote re both have the same kind of idea we're talking like a uh, single header file or single file c projects uh, with simple apis that we could wrap these are probably macros but we could again we can wrap those in functions compile them generate list bindings it would still be pretty interesting for us to do that there seems to be some gpu timing stuff in here as well which is very interesting um yeah one day I would really love us to do that, especially because these are cross-platform as well, which is fun. So yeah, that's it. Thanks so much for hanging out, folks. Um, I'll catch you next time. Peace.